want to talk about design. I'm not a designer. I sometimes work with them and tell them what to do and assume things are easier than they are. Um, I sometimes manage designers, but I'm intimately familiar with design because I was designed. I was designed by my mother. And that's what I want to talk to you about, myself as a product of my mother's design. I am a comedian. I've been doing stand-up comedy for about 10 years. I do this work at The Onion, uh, directing a lot of our digital strategy and some of our political coverage. It's very much fun. I've just written a book. It's called How to Be Black. <laughs> and here's the thing about the book. I have designed a genius marketing strategy for it. If you don't buy my book, you're a racist. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Bestseller by guilt. <laughs> no one's ever done that, I'm pretty sure. But I want to start with a story. I want to start a while ago. The year is 1870. A man named Benjamin Lonesome is born in Carroll County, Virginia, after the Emancipation Proclamation, yet born a slave. Taught himself to read. In 1896, moved to Washington, D.C., where he worked for the highway department, surfacing roads. That is my great-grandfather. Gave birth to two daughters, one of whom is my maternal grandmother, Lorraine Martin, who only after my own mother died in 2005 did I find out this woman was the first black employee in the U.S. Supreme Court. And there's a feature in the background in the yellowing paper from the Afro newspaper, and they asked her, what's it like to work in the Supreme Court building? And she said, it's awe-inspiring. And they asked her boss, Miss Catherine Waddle, pictured in the back on the right, what's it like working with Miss Lorraine Martin? And she goes, well, she's just fine. <laughs> she's just fine. She got a little commendation from then-President Jimmy Carter. It was cool. My grandmother was a hustler. She loved to travel the world. She loved to live. She loved her social life. She did not necessarily love the act of raising my adorable mother. That's a four-year-old Arnita Lorraine Thurston, who was clearly the source of any cuteness I have retained. <laughs> her mother, we're talking 1948, sent this little girl to boarding school in Cornwells Heights, Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. Now, back then, that was very rural. It was a Catholic school set up, and she was probably doing it in part because she could. And that's kind of a cool status symbol to send your little girl the 1940s, little black girl, to a private boarding school. That's crazy. But she also wanted to free up some of her time. <laughs> my mother did not necessarily enjoy all of her time there. Here is the letter my mother wrote to her mother at eight years old. <laughs> Dear mother, I am having fun, but I do not like it here. I am mad at you. Please send me some cookies and a Sparkle Plenty doll. They can have dolls here. Please send it because I do not have anything to play with. Yours truly, Arnita. Adorable, a little sad. But I want you to focus on the lower right corner of the letter. You see in a different hand, in a different marker, the word over. So let's turn that letter over. If your little girl is dissatisfied, we'd be glad to have her bed for children who are anxious to come. <laughs> Signed, sister. So that's like some Patriot Act NSA type wiretapping. <laughs> in 1948 <laughs> for a little girl who was no threat to anybody, <laughs> anybody. My mother did not stay long in the school. She came back to D.C. She ended up at Benjamin Banneker, then junior high school. She went into the media, not unlike me. My older sister is also in the newspaper business. She was a features editor of the newspaper. But take a look at this image. This is the very major model of a proper Negro woman a dress below the knees, and a basket to boot. What's in the basket? Why are you carrying a basket? I don't know. But it's real quaint looking. My mother adhered for a time to the rules of the household and the mores of the era around her, but pretty soon she started hanging out with dudes that look like this. 
That dude's name is El Dorado. <laughs> El Dorado. He is the coolest man you will never meet. Look at the shoes, look at the pants, look at the shirt, look at the hair, look at the way he holds that antiquated thing, that phone thing. Makes you want to have a phone thing in your life to be as cool as this dude. You can't touch that. <laughs> My mom starts hanging out with people like El Dorado, starts hanging out with Nigerians and Eritreans and black power activists and yes, we can type people and starts changing up her dress from Dresses below the knees with baskets to crowds that look like these with signs, right? 16th Street outside of Malcolm X Park, and there is my mother right up in the mix. Because the revolution will not be televised, but just in case it is, you want your hair done up right. <laughs> Eyes locked to the frame. So my mom gets this revolutionary flavor, and that is the path that she sets out on. But that black and white becomes this black and white, and this is the neighborhood that I grew up into. This is Washington, D.C., circa 1987, Newton Street. And that is the common scene out of our front window. See, I grew up under Mayor Marion Barry. People love to remind me that my mayor was a crackhead. I know my mayor was a crackhead. <laughs> I was there. Physically, I sold him the crack. I was there. I know. <laughs> My mayor was a crackhead. <laughs> My neighborhood was a lot like The Wire. Too much like The Wire. Exactly like The Wire. We had police corruption. We had murders. We had clearly drug dealing. We had everything The Wire has except universal critical acclaim mm -hmm. and the undying love of white people who saw it. We were missing that. But otherwise, this was a common scene, and my mother just wanted to document it. I'm not even sure why. I think she just recognized the shifting era we were in and didn't want anyone to forget. So now if there's ever a drug dealer reunion, I'm making all the money on the photo sales. <laughs> so I got those moments captured. I think about my life in retrospect, even though I'm very young, because I've seen her life pass through, and I've become so grateful for the tools that she gave me and there were three principles that if she were to write them down, she'd be like, yo, these are my principles of design. I don't think when I was a little baby, she talked to me and said, I have three principles of design for your life. Here they are. Are you ready? Like, it wasn't quite like that. But as I look back, these were the things that helped me figure out what I am and what I should do. Number one, respect. Not just a word. Not just something she demanded from me, but something she expected for me to demand from others. Respect for self. This is an example of the type of note my mother would leave me in birthday cards. Baratunde, fear not, you are a child of the universe. Faith, there will be something solid in the darkness for you to stand on, or you will be taught how to fly. Have faith, love, mommy lady. <laughs> That's the kind of recurring note that showed up under the Christmas tree and in the Kwanzaa candle thing. No baby talk. My mother did not talk down to us. There was no gag, gag, goo, goo. She shared what was happening. When we declared bankruptcy, I knew about it because she told us. Not because she was trying to scare us, but because she knew that this was an important moment. And she damn sure didn't want us to end up there as well. So rather than hiding the possible shame of it, learn from the lesson of it. Talk to us about what's going on. She also always used to say, I can't read your mind. Tell me what you're thinking. Talk to me. Tell me what's going on. That communication in the household, even on awkward topics, was something I grew up into from a very, very young age. Now, she was clearly a pro-black, pan-African, radical hippie with a radio station takeover and FBI file to her credit. And having that background <laughs> meant that I had a non-typical entertainment factor in my household. <laughs> I did not have Saturday morning cartoons, for example. I had like apartheid lecture series <laughs> at age eight that I led. This is a sample of reading material from my pre, like, early childhood. This is one of the first books I ever got. This is Apartheid, a pictorial introduction. That is not Cat in the Hat, guys. That is not. <laughs> you get that stuff in your head from a young age, it starts to affect you, you know what I mean, in a good way, in a good way. Respect for women. This was not a heavy-handed message. I grew up in a household dominated by women, except for me, my mother, my sister, and every animal we ever had. 
I don't listen carefully to women because it's the good thing to do. I had to. I had no choice. I had no choice. It was the natural environment for me. Respect for self, defense of self. I remember when I got jumped, these kids held me down, took my bike, and I couldn't do anything about it. There were many of them. There was one of me, and I went home crying to my mother, and I told her, and she wanted to go out and fight them. But what would the user experience for me be? <laughs> Expecting her to take on all my battles. No, so she signed me up for Taekwondo and said, you go fight them the next time something like this happens. And the next time I'm surrounded by a bunch of fingers with square eyes, I know exactly what to do. <laughs> Question authority is a common bumper sticker you see in little liberal enclaves on Subarus around America. <laughs> my mother gave me this bumper sticker, and I put it up in my locker at school. Question authority, except for hers, maybe a little double. Standard, maybe a little double standard. This is a great moment. This is me with the soccer ball, my best friend at the time, Dwayne. We had gone off to the mountains, Blue Ridge Mountains, I believe. We brought a soccer ball. We liked kicking the ball around. And at one point, I picked up the ball, and my mother stopped us from playing. And she says, you can't touch the ball. It's soccer. You're not the goalie. You have to respect the game. And she took the ball from us. And we didn't play soccer ever again. <laughs> we like kicked rocks around like we could have done back home. Sometimes respect went over the line. There's another story. This is high school me, senior year. I wrestled by accident. I wrestled by accident. I was walking around the school. The coach came up to me. I didn't know him. I wasn't a wrestler. He said, hey, we have a match tonight. There's somebody around your weight class that the other team doesn't have, you can help us take the win. You want to come with us? I was like, yeah, I'm a team player. I'll do that. Rolled out to the match. Sure enough, there is no other player. We take the win. So happens that's the night of the team photo. All my friends are like, y'all be in the photo with us. Do it. I'm like, yeah, I'm in the photo. I'll wrestle. Woo. I get home that night. My mother's, yo, where have you been? Oh, it was great. I got to help out the wrestling team. I got to help out the wrestling team. I got to be in the team photo. And she said, whoa. You cheated, and now you're in the team photo, so it sounds like you just joined the wrestling team. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. First real match I ever had against a corporeal opponent was due to the karma I had sown, the national champion for the state of Maryland. <laughs> Some Russian kid that they had imported <laughs> just to whoop my ass. And you can't use karate on a wrestling match, so it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I lost shamefully and loudly and cryingly. <laughs> Respect, theme number one. Theme number two, exploration, exploration, exploration. We were constantly on the move. There was no money, but we were still out there. We took road trips all up and down the East Coast. We went camping, which is like budget hotels, basically. <laughs> we did a lot of stuff, and it wasn't just the physical. There was also sort of an intellectual exploration. I was in a DC Youth Orchestra program, got to tour playing upright bass when I was 10 years old, going to Knoxville, Tennessee. Who does that? I got sent and offered and said yes to go to a crazy weird camp in upstate New York in the Adirondack Mountains, six weeks. No running water, no electricity. Every week you hike a different Adirondack mountain. Yeah. That is not your stereotypical inner city black male youth experience. <laughs> but for someone whose mother is an explorer, it is. It is. Now this is where things get magically interesting. Obviously, when you're this revolutionary, pan-African black, sort of tofu-eating mother, you want to take all that black power and bundle it up into your son and then inflict him on white people <laughs> in the form of private school. So I went to the Sidwell Friends School, starting in seventh grade. That's where the Obama girls go now. That's where Chelsea Clinton went two years behind me. And I was like a little fish out of water. You know, I showed up. I used to ask people questions. Right? I had a mild case of Ebonics. It's dangerous to talk to me. You would bleed. <laughs> but I'm around all these people. One of my classmates is the son of the publisher of the New York Times. 
You got Congress people sending their kids there, power brokers, IMF, World Bank type folks. Yet at the same time, the principal of the middle school was a black dude named Bob Williams. And Bob Williams was a member of an organization called Ancobia, and that was created by a bunch of 1960s pro-black Afrocentric folk to preserve some kind of connection to Africa. And they had created this rites of passage program modeled on Ghana and the Akan people there to help usher you from boyhood to manhood and girlhood to womanhood. So there were physical exercises, mental reading lists that included Marcus Garvey, Francis Cress Welsing, and others. And so I'm at Sidwell during the week, hanging out with people A. <laughs> and then Saturdays, I'm in like Black Power Boot Camp, <laughs> hanging out with people B. And it's not like my mother sent me into the world and said, go become a critical thinker. That's not how it works. She created an environment which forced me to think critically and set up these divergent paths, this high contrast situation. She used to always say to me, heighten the contradiction. She modeled that by creating a massive contradiction around me. Africans are only kings and queens. The white man does everything. There are no black people. That's an extreme painting of both perspectives, but you understand the contrast that I was forced to navigate on my own. And that's also a sign of respect to offer your child. This is me in the White House acting the fool. No great lesson here, it's just a great shot. <laughs> they let me in once. I was baptized Catholic. She felt a debt of gratitude to the Catholic Church for them making the tuition for my older sister at the Catholic school so accessible to her. They let her work it off by cooking dinners, by working in the secretary pool, by writing letters. But then I was like, I wanna go to another church the Episcopal Church, for my deep-seated belief in convenience. Because <laughs> it was right across the street, and the Catholic Church was like five blocks away. And there was this really cute girl that went to the Episcopal Church. And my mom started flirting with Buddhism and Taoism and the I Ching, and all these things were brought into the household, and she just showed it. She never pushed us. She just showed it, let us find our own way. This is a shot from Mexico. We took a big train trip around the country and into Mexico, two and a half weeks. Got one of these rail passes. I don't even know if you can still buy them. And uh, we, we packed peanut butter ahead of time. That's basically where we ate peanut butter and raisins. But the magic of this trip for me is the train. A train is a magical thing. A train is like a car, right? So you have this ground level view, but it goes faster, generally. It's not your Amtrak today. And that's not their fault. That's a funding problem. So a train is like a car, but it also has this plain feel. It's got some luxuries, but it's also like a little town. A train's a little neighborhood, at least. You got the lounge car. You're meeting people. You're talking. You, you dine with other people. A train is a city on wheels. A train is a moving community. And on this trip, we met some amazing people along the way, folks who had lost their jobs and were trying to reinvent themselves. All right? Exactly. Folks pursuing love or a dream or hopefully the overlap of those two things. It was very, very cool to be able to see all that. And that leads to the third and final element of design that informed my own growth and development community. My mother did not have a strong, hyper-local community for herself. Her own family bonds were very frayed. This is the only photo that my sister and I can find of my mother and her mother. And it says proof on it not developed, right? So that community to her was not present, but others were. Martha's Table in Washington, D.C. is a soup kitchen. They run a van called McKenna's Wagon, which goes to parks around the city and serves food. Every week in my life, probably from age 5 to 13, we volunteered, handing out donuts. Handing out donuts is the best. Everybody loves donuts unless you're un-American. <laughs> Thank you. Put some bacon on it, just die right there. <laughs> Seriously, you would die. You would die right there. So we do this every week, and what's interesting to me about this is a different type of community. You're seeing the city from a different angle. You're interacting with people who everyone ignores. You're not reading a book about homelessness. You're actually interacting with people and understanding, well, why are you? You have a suit. You have a job. 
but you don't have a home. We're like, I couldn't get a home because I couldn't get a job. I couldn't get a job because I don't have a home. And to, to hear that at seven years old affects your mind. Again, so that was a different angle on community. Shot on the left, shortly after my birth, I'm a little pudgy one in green. <laughs> Shot on the right, I'm the real handsome kid. The real handsome one right there, you see that one? <laughs> <laughs> Middle school graduation. Community was family. And this is the family. This was our nuclear family. Me, my mother, my sister. She was always vying for us to do things together. I actually took this idea of community and used it in a political context at my high school. I had some beef with the administration. I thought they had wronged a lot of us. So I put up wanted signs for them uh, and charged them with crimes against the community. <laughs> so that's what happens when you have a black power activist as a mother. Uh, you just start wanting people around you. <laughs> in college, I had a very difficult class, Computer Science 141. I was a philosophy major, but I was taking this class because I had made a deal with a friend, a black dude actually, named Harvard, at Harvard. That's a whole nother talk. <laughs> Between sophomore and junior year, Harvard was killed in a car accident, along with one of our other classmates. And I had agreed to take this class with him, and he wasn't around, and I was like, yo, this is a good way to get out of this weird obligation, because I don't really want to fail this class. But then I thought, well, actually, no, I have to take the class. And I took the class, I took it pass-fail, meaning I didn't want to fail. And then I proceeded to nearly fail. And I got to winter break. We had this final project. We had to build a computer from scratch. I'm talking like wires and little chips that you program in assembly language on a wafer board and all this weird stuff. And I didn't know because I hadn't really learned throughout the semester. I'd been very distracted. You can't build a computer if you didn't learn how to build a computer. <laughs> so I call up my mother crying, hoping for a shoulder to lean on. And I say, look, um, I can't do this. This is very hard. I am generally good at things. I am not good at this thing. Help me. And like the karate moment, she did not give me a big virtual hug over the phone. Here's what she said. She said, you need to stop talking about what you can't do. I know you can do this. I've seen you do a lot more. I know you can do this because I've done a lot more, and you're me. I know you can do this because your people have done a lot more, and you're them. This is not a challenge for you. Go ahead and build that computer. And so I, uh, shocked by the invocation of my entire ancestry <laughs> and the entire history of blackness, now on my shoulders on a pass-fail class. I stayed all winter break. I retook the class by myself. I read the book from front to back twice and aced that final thing. Aced that final thing. And this is the graduation moment. This is the graduation moment. This is, this is the ultimate community moment in some ways because when she hugged me, clearly crying, she said, we did it. <laughs> yeah, we did it. We did it. That is my mother, Arnita Lorraine Thurston, still with me and thus still with all of us, my chief designer. Thank you very much. <laughs>